everyone. In this video, I'm going to be breaking down the comic series called Paper Girls, written by Brian K. Vaughn. Paper Girls is being adapted into a TV show on Amazon Prime Video, and it is coming out in just a few weeks. Now, in this video, I am going to be breaking down just Volume 1, but over the next several weeks, I am planning on covering the entire six-volume series. Now, what is Paper Girls about? It is about these four newspaper delivery girls, and they become friends, and it is set in the 1980s. And the girls, they get sucked into this crazy time travel high science fiction adventure. And it is quite compelling. It very much reminds me of Stranger Things in its vibe. Although this comic came out before Stranger Things, so don't think it's ripping Stranger Things off. If anything, Stranger Things is ripping this thing off. Now, some of you might be a little bit mm, against following female lead characters, but trust me. The girls in this book are very compelling and funny and very relatable, so don't let that hold you back. Now, Brian K. Vaughn is one of my favorite writers. Uh, I covered his series Why the Last Man here on my channel, so check that out if you have not. Now, Why the Last Man recently also got adapted into a TV show. Unfortunately, it got canceled, but hopefully Paper Girls will uh, do better than that show did. He also wrote Saga, another great series, which I also covered here on my channel, so check that out as well. All right, let's dive into it now. Volume 1 of Paper Girls. Paper Girls, Volume 1, written by Brian K. Vaughn, art by Cliff Chiang, colors by Matt Wilson, and letters by Jared K. Fletcher. Let's start off first with a character breakdown. Our main paper girls that we will be following this series are Erin Tiang. She is the new girl in town. She is Asian. She attends a Catholic school called St. Nick's, and she carries a pocket knife. There is Mackenzie Coyle. Most people just call her Mac. She has ginger hair and is a cigarette-smoking tomboy who swears constantly. Mac was the first girl to become a paper boy in their town. She is cynical and snarky and comes from a blue-collar Irish Catholic family. There is KJ or Karina or Cage, as she is sometimes referred to. She is considered the smart one of the group. KJ attends a private school named Buttonwood Academy. She plays field hockey and she is Jewish. There is Tiffany Quilkin. She is an obsessive gamer who loves her walkie-talkies. She is African-American, and she is the adopted daughter of a mixed-race family. She attends a Catholic school called St. Pete's. Now that you know our four main paper girls, let's dive into Issue 1. It is November 1st, 1988, the morning after Halloween. 12-year-old girl Erin Tiang is a new resident in Stony Stream, a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio, and she is a recently hired paper delivery girl for the Cleveland Preserver newspaper. Erin wakes up early this morning in the 4 a.m. hour to deliver the papers to the various homes in her neighborhood. Erin, when she wakes up, asks her sister Missy, whom she shares a bedroom with, if she's dead. Missy, annoyed that her sleep is disturbed by her sister, shoots her sister a snarky look. Erin takes pleasure in annoying her. Erin, she sees the newspaper truck drop off a stack of papers in front of her home for delivering. It is time for her to get to work. On Erin's calendar, she refers to this particular morning as Hell Morning. Because it was Halloween the night before, there are still some crazies and teenagers who may still be prowling the streets from the night before. Erin, she gets on her bike and begins cycling the neighborhood, delivering papers. On her route, Erin runs into another teenager named Lucas Kurzenberger, who is dressed as Freddy Krueger. Lucas and his friends are up to no good. They have spray paint cans with them and are doing some sort of vandalism. Lucas, he yells at Aaron to give him a newspaper right now. Aaron refuses. Lucas tries to grab one out of her bag. Aaron is saved from this hassling of these teenagers by a group of other newspaper delivery girls arriving. 
there is Mackenzie Coyle with orange hair, Tiffany Quilkin on her left, and KJ or Karina on her right. Mackenzie, or Mac, yells at Lucas to get lost. She tells him, or I'll tell your gym coach of a dad that you were out past curfew harassing little girls. Lucas and his friends slink off, but before they leave, Lucas says, Whatever. Good luck getting home alive, bitch. Erin thanks Mac and her friends for coming to her rescue. All four girls then discuss what it is like working as paper girls in this town. Also, which school they go to and whatnot. Mac, she pulls out a cigarette and says, You rich girls want to compare report cards all night, or can we get back to business? The girls don't usually deliver papers together, but because this is the day after Halloween, they decide to split off into two groups and deliver in teams, just for safety. Mac and Aaron as one team, and Tiffany and KJ as another. Tiffany gives Mac one of her walkie-talkies she also oh, cherishes. They are actually kind of expensive, especially if you are a 12-year-old girl in 1988. So she gives it to Mac, so that way the two groups can stay in contact with one another. Behind Aaron in the neighborhood right now, we see three people wrapped up in black bandages, almost like a mummy. These are not normal trick-or-treaters, though. They are something more sinister. I mean, look at this one guy's eye. It's all messed up and whatnot. More on them later, though. Aaron and Mac are biking their route, and Mac is telling Aaron the tricks of the newspaper delivery girl the trade. The two of them then get stopped by a police officer. He says to the girls, I got multiple reports of someone smashing windows in this development. Mac, who comes from a rougher family with a troublemaker older brother, asks, So what? Cop replies, So you getting into the family business, Mac? Mac denies it, and Aaron defends Mac, saying that she was with her all night. She did nothing. The cop accepts this for now, but he shouts a warning to Mac, saying, Keep it up, Coil, sooner or later. And then he leaves. Mac says, Sooner or later what? <laughs> Erin is surprised that her new friend she's making here, Mac, is known by the police? She asks Mac, the police know you by name? Mac replies, I guess. Erin then asks, um, so what do cigarettes taste like anyway? Before Mac can answer though, they hear something startling on the walkie-talkie. It sounds like someone is attacking them. Tiffany reports in the walkie-talkie, we're on the corner of Locust and Ash, and we're... Hey, stop! Hey, don't touch her! I'll... <laughs> the walkie-talkie then cuts out. Aaron and Mac, concerned, bike as quickly as they can over there. And when they arrive, they see Tiffany scraped her knee. And KJ and Tiffany say that they got jumped by three guys in bad ghost costumes. They were referring to those three sinister dudes we saw earlier behind Aaron. Tiffany, she starts tearing up. They stole her walkie-talkie. It cost her a lot of money to buy all her Christmas tips. Months of riding in the freezing cold down the drain. Aaron asks if they should phone the police. But Tiffany and Mac argue the police in Stony Stream are useless. Mac thinks that they should take matters into their own hands. Mac speaks into the walkie-talkie that she has a warning. She says, hey, Whichever dumb fucks robbed our friend, if you can hear this, get ready, because we're coming to get our shit back. The four girls bike towards where they think the three mystery men went. The girls then believe that the mystery men went inside this house that is under construction. So they climb into the house through the window, and they begin looking around. They have their flashlight on as it is dark inside. They hear a sound and in the basement. So the girls head downstairs. In the basement, they see a black tarp covering something. They remove the tarp and reveal a very odd-looking machine. KJ thinks it's a piece of modern art, maybe. Aaron thinks maybe it's from outer space. It looks like the Apollo capsule. The girls investigate it a bit closer. Eventually, the capsule starts making a weird noise, and a large light gets emitted into the room and we see the girls' skeletons for a brief moment. 
And then, after all of this commotion, everything returns to normal. The girls, they begin booking it and running out of the house, scared. Is that machine going to explode? What the hell was it? The girls, as they head outside, they look into the night sky. And it looks all trippy and weird. Way more stars than normal. And everything looks all bright. Tiffany, she spots the mysterious walkie-talkie thieves nearby. And the four girls begin running after them. The three mystery men, they speak in an odd futuristic language, indecipherable to us. The three men, they run into separate directions. KJ gets close to one, but she gets clocked in the face by the man. Mac, angry now, jumps on the man and grabs at his mask and yanks it off, revealing a hideous-looking, deformed man. This man is named Naldo. Naldo speaks in a language none of the girls understand. Naldo, he then starts strangling Mac. Tiffany, she whacks Naldo in the head with KJ's field hockey stick. And Naldo, he mutters something and then runs off. The girls, they regain their composure. They notice that Naldo dropped something in all of the commotion. And it has a weird symbol on it. Aaron picks it up and says, it's an apple. This device they are holding that Naldo had is some sort of apple device from the future. It is not an apple device I recognize, so it must be from even further in the future than our current day, 2022. But for Aaron and her friends back in 1988, where Apple was just known for a few of its computers, this device seems even stranger and more peculiar. Issue 2 We see one of Naldo's allies running in the neighborhood. His name is Jude. Jude looks confused, not sure where to go. He jumps a fence and is in someone's backyard when suddenly a rift opens in the sky above him and a goddamn pterodactyl comes out of the rift and it swoops down and lifts Jude up into the air and blood splatters everywhere. We then see the hand of a man dressed in white and he grabs the bag that Jude was carrying and he removes Tiffany's walkie-talkie. Back to the paper girls, they retreat to Aaron's house trying to figure out what is going on. What was with that machine? Why were they attacked? Why is the sky all weird now? Aaron's parents and sisters have all disappeared. Mac comments, after all the insane crap going on, your family probably got the hell out of Stony Stream. Even though the world is going crazy right now, KJ can't help but comment how weird it is that Aaron's family gives out Full-size Hershey bars for Halloween? Full-size? Mac says, Jesus, how can you two think about candy when the town's being overrun by monsters? The girls, they then hear some noises come through the walkie-talkie from whoever retrieved Tiffany's other walkie-talkie. The noises are just weird grunting, maybe laughing. The girls decide that they need to phone the police, finally. But when Mac tries to phone, she reports, there's no dial tone, just that emergency broadcast sound. I'm telling you, everybody must have gotten the order to evacuate. Mac says they should all go to her house. Her dad has a gun. Aaron thinks that they should just stay here and let the adults handle things. But Mac argues, the adults already blew this popsicle stand, new kid so you can hide out here and wait for those Frankensteins to break in and rape your face, but I'm going to find a way to defend myself. Who's with me? The girls have a vote. Mac, Tiffany, and KJ all vote to get Mac's dad's gun at her house. Erin, she is hesitant, but she decides to go along with them. And the four paper girls begin biking to Mac's house. On their way, they discuss their theories on what the Apple device is. Remember everyone, this is 1988. Aaron says, Hmm, the device has a logo on it, a lot like the one on the computer my school got last year. I've been thinking, what if this is some kind of micro version of it? KJ not believing it says, How would you fit an entire computer inside something the size of a Klondike bar? 
Aaron replies. Well, 30 years ago, computers used to fill up entire rooms. Maybe they'll get even smaller in the future. KJ Puzzled asks, Speck up, you think we're being invaded by what? Time travelers? Aaron argues, it's at least sort of scientifically possible. I mean, what if the people who jumped us used that capsule thing we found to slingshot around the sun, you know, like in Star Trek 4? Mac, who's biking ahead of them and smoking, yells at KJ and Aaron, saying, Hey, Siskel and Ebert, would you please zip it? We're supposed to be keeping our eyes peeled. All of a sudden, a whole bunch of pterodactyls and lightning come from the sky. And now the girls are really confused. What is going on? They begin biking as fast as they've ever biked in their lives, until eventually they arrive at Mac's house. Mac's house is kind of shitty. It kind of reminds me of Kenny's house in South Park. When they arrive, Mac is looking for her dad's gun in the closet, and they are interrupted by Mac's stepmother, Alice Coyle. Alice is drinking some whiskey, and she is already plastered. Mac asks, Where's my dad? Alice answers, I was dozing next to him in bed when this, this awful sound woke us both up and then... And then I watched my husband just vanish. He disappeared into thin air. Alice then tells the girls her theory, that those creatures outside mean that it's the end of the world. She believes that Mac's dad, because he was a good man, got sucked up to heaven. But the rest of them, sinners, are down here, stranded. Alice, she then pulls out the gun that Mac was looking for. And she points the gun to her head and she says she is going to kill herself. Alice begins crying and says, I hated being 12. Back in 1965, I just wanted to grow up fast so everything would finally be good, you know? But the truth is, life was actually better back then. Turns out, the older you get, the more everything just turns to shit. You girls are lucky you'll never have to find that out. Mac, she begins yelling, saying, Don't! and she tries to wrestle the gun out of her stepmom's hands. In the ensuing scuffle, the gun fires. A loud bang screams out. Issue 3 Over at the high school, there is a teenage boy and teenage girl, and they are watching a portal or a rift in the sky open and lightning and pterodactyls are coming out. A lot of their friends just vanished and they seem to be left behind, wondering why. The male teenager decides to kiss the female teenager, assuming because it is the end of the world, he may as well take his chance with her. He gets pushed away though and rejected. The girl says, what is wrong with you? I don't even like you like that, psycho. Before they can argue some more, a man wearing all white riding a pterodactyl lands near them. This man is named Alistair. He is the man that retrieved the walkie-talkie from Jude's dead body last issue. Alistair points his weird magical staff weapon at the teenagers and fires an energy beam at them and makes them disappear. Alistair then says into a communication device, Hey, I paused up two more stragglers back over to Mac's house. The gun that accidentally went off fired and shot at Aaron. Aaron is bleeding now and she falls down. The girls want to try and get Aaron to the hospital. Alice, the only adult there, seemed to have ran off or disappeared. The girls are not sure. Either way though, the girls decide to drive to the hospital to get Aaron help. The girls are really young though and none of them know how to drive. Tiffany decides that she will be the driver. Her dad let her steer in the parking lot before. Mac wants to bring the gun, but the other girls are arguing against it now. They don't want someone else accidentally getting shot. They all eventually leave. Tiffany is driving, KJ is in the front seat, and Aaron is lying in the back seat with Mac putting pressure on Aaron's wound. Elsewhere. We see those mysterious men in black bandages again. One of them is Naldo, and the other is named Heck. They find their comrade Jude dead in the backyard of someone's home. This concerns them, so Heck 
pulls out what looks like a ray gun and is ready to use it. The paper girls are driving when Alistair appears before them in the road. Tiffany slams on the brakes. Alistair begins talking to them. We can understand his English, but he speaks in a very odd way, in a modified version of English, heavily dependent on slang similar to Old English in style. Alistair says, No, no, how you lurked so long, but end credits for Delot, masters, your transgresses willn't be. Tiffany begins talking to the man, and she tries to explain that her friend Aaron got shot and they're trying to get her help. Alistair then realizes that these girls in front of him are not from the future time, they are locals to this time. So Alistair reaches for an electronic red translator device he has, and he starts translating his words to the girls. Alistair through the translator device says, My sincere apologies, this must have been very troubling for you to witness. I promise you won't remember a thing. Alistair starts prepping his staff weapon to fire on the girls. The girls start freaking out, but Alistair reassures them, saying, I give you my word that none of you will be harmed, and that wounds of your injured companion will be addressed. Mac is confused, she asks. What does that mean? Can these people fix Aaron or not? Alistair continues, Children, your questions will be answered, but it's very dangerous for you to be out during ablution. If you would please remain perfectly still, I can take you to... Before Alistair can finish his sentence, he gets shot in the head. The girls panic. They think KJ did it, as KJ is holding the gun, but she did not. It was Heck and Naldo who caught up to the girls. The two mysterious men in black bandages grab Alistair's translator device, and they begin talking with it to the girls. Heck explains to the girls, Trust us, help is the last thing these old-timers would have given you. And we're not aliens, we're just like you. We're teenagers. Heck, he reveals his face, and like Naldo, he also suffers from deformities. Issue 4 We see a man lying in a bed wearing a public enemy shirt. This man is referred to as Grandfather. Grandfather appears to be a leader of some sort. He gets a phone call from a soldier woman named Cardinal. Cardinal reports in that Alistair is dead. Grandfather says that they best call down something called an Editrix. Cardinal asks if Grandfather is serious about that. He answers quite. Can't risk another sea day. Down in the sewers. The pair of deformed teenagers, named Naldo and Heck, are leading the paper girls to safety. Heck tells them, Let's keep moving, unless you want to take your chances out there with the old timers. KJ demands some answers, before her and her friends go any further. Heck says, The sooner you quit waving that thing at us, the sooner we'll be able to get your friend to a device that can heal her. KJ, talking about Alistair, says that... That's what the man in white promised them before you murdered him. Heck explains, I didn't murder anyone. I executed the evil son of a bitch for murdering my boyfriend, Jude. Even in 1988, people were not as easily accepting of gays and still found it a little shocking to find out someone was gay. Tiffany replies with confusion, Your boyfriend? Mac replies, Ew. KJ tells Mac to be more respectful. Heck doesn't take offense, though. He tells the girls, don't worry about it. You guys are from an effed up time. As they continue to traverse through the sewers, they hear an odd noise. Heck, worried, explains it is something called an Editrix. He continues explaining to the girls what it is, but then he realizes that his translator device that he's been using, the one that he picked up from Alistair, it must have some sort of tracking in it. And that is how the old timers have been tracking them. So he destroys it, although now he can't speak with the girls and have them understand him. Just then, the Editrix floats in front of them in the sewer and managed to track them down. An Editrix looks like a 
floating green glowy ball thing with tentacles coming out of it and each tentacle has an eye on it. These Edatrixes are mysterious beings of unknown origin that came from the fourth dimension. Heck attempts to shoot the Edatrix with his ray gun, but the Edatrix fires on Heck out of one of its eyes with the laser and Heck falls down. Mac yells for KJ to shoot at it, but KJ admits that she didn't bring any bullets. She didn't want anyone else to get accidentally shot. The Edatrix with one of its tentacles starts strangling Tiffany. When the Edatrix touches someone, that person sees flashes of their past and future. As the Edatrix is strangling Tiffany, she sees flashes of her life playing out. Almost all of the flashes seem to be Tiffany playing this video game that is like Brick Breaker, and Tiffany appears to have played this game for many years. At one point, she gets to round 35 and is excited. That is further than she's ever gotten before. But then she gets game over and it was back to round one. And she plays some more. Is this what Tiffany's life has in store for her? Many years of playing this video game? Eventually, in real life, KJ tackles Tiffany away from the Edatrix, breaking the tentacle off. And Tiffany stops having these memory flashes. Naldo with his ray gun then shoots at the Edatrix multiple times until he runs out of ammo, but he seems to have killed it. Tiffany explains to KJ, When I touched that thing, I saw my life flash before my eyes. I started like reliving it. It was hell. Most of it was just me playing that same dumb game. I didn't even think I liked it that much, but now I realize I basically wasted my entire existence. God, I can still hear it. I can still hear that crappy music from the game. Why didn't I stop when I was stuck at level 28 for so long? Eventually, Heck, Naldo, and the Paper Girls exit the sewer, and they are in a forest. Heck and Naldo lead the girls to one of their capsule devices, identical to the one in the basement the girls saw earlier. Heck sticks his hand in an opening of the capsule device, and it opens. KJ suspects that they've probably got some kind of futuristic first aid in there for Aaron. Like one of those MRI things, right? Heck and Naldo bring Aaron, who is almost dead from her gunshot wound, with them into the capsule. The rest of the girls are hesitant. Heck, he tries to explain to the girls what they are doing, but without the translation device, everything they say is just gibberish, so his explanations don't really help. The capsule door closes with Aaron, Heck, and Naldo inside, and the girls on the outside. Mac is concerned. She says, now what? We're just supposed to wait out here while they play seven minutes in heaven in there? The capsule device activates, and it disappears. Mac gets angry and says, those lying assholes bailed on us. They kidnapped Aaron. Alright, before I dive into the final issue of Volume 1, I want to take a step back now and explain a little bit of the different factions we've now heard a little bit about and spent some time with. So one faction is the Old Timers, and the other faction is known as the Teenagers. We know there is some sort of time travel stuff going on, and so far we've heard of these two groups, so let's start by explaining a little bit about the Old Timers. Old Timers are the first generation of humans following the invention of time travel. They strongly believe in preserving the original timeline and strictly enforce the rules regarding time travel. They don't want people going to the past and changing things. The Old Timers speak in a modified version of English, heavily dependent on slang similar to Old English in style. We the readers are able to sort of understand them, but their slang is sometimes sounding a little bit stupid and takes a little bit of time to figure out. Their leader is known by the title of Grandfather. We saw him giving some orders this issue. A subsect of the Old Timers are a group known as Restorers. They are the people actively working to restore timelines altered by the events of the war. We've seen two Restorers so far, Alistair and Cardinal. 
the restorers have the ability to erase and alter a person's memory. So all of the people that have been disappearing from Stony Stream were disappeared by these restorers, and they were only doing so to protect the timeline. All those people would have their memory wiped, and then they would be returned back to normal without their memories of all the weird, confusing stuff they saw, and the timeline would therefore stay intact. Okay, so we have the old timers who are supported by the restorers, but the group they are warring against and having a time war with are called the Teenagers. The Teenagers are the descendants of the old timers from way in the future, even further in the future. Grandfather refers to them as teenagers regardless of age, so some of the teenagers might actually be in their 20s or even older, but to Grandfather and the rest of the old timers, they are all teenagers. The teenagers believe in the idea of altering history for the better. Unlike the old timers, the teenagers do not have any rules regarding time travel. They often seek the assistance of locals, people living in the present time, to provide them with information for the war effort. And they speak in an even more futuristic language that is so convoluted it is only decipherable through translation gadgets. Alright, now that we know about these two main groups, let us continue on with Issue 5, the final issue in the first volume. Heck and Naldo have brought Aaron to a place called their Wen House. There is some huge Apple device in there that does God knows what. Heck and Naldo are both wearing translation collars now, and Aaron can communicate easily with them. Naldo tells Aaron to let the bugs do their work. These weird, disgusting bugs are all over Aaron's bullet wound in her body and they are healing her and repairing the tissue. Erin is grossed out though. She says she thinks she might throw up. Heck tells her, don't throw up on the insects. But insects is spelled in that stupid way that Apple spells everything with a lowercase i and then an uppercase n and then s-e-c-s. -E so these insects are actually some sort of first aid device invented by Apple in the future. Erin, now feeling a little bit better, starts talking to Heck and Naldo, and she accuses them of stealing Tiffany's walkie-talkie. Heck and Naldo explain they are more so scavengers than thieves, really. Yesterday's trash is tomorrow's treasure. They say they found this badass spaceship they're in right now in some dump. Erin, confused, asks, Spaceship? I thought you were time travelers, not astronauts. Naldo explains, well... Since Earth never stops moving, it's a bad idea to time travel without also considering location. Say you're standing in the middle of Stony Stream and you jump straight back one hour. You'll just end up floating in the frozen vacuum where the planet is about to be. Anyway, congrats, you're about to become an astronaut. Erin is still confused. Naldo tells her to not worry about it. They are going to bring her back to her friends, and then she will be fine. Just then, though, some old-timers arrive in space as well with their own ships, and they are trying to ground Heck and Aldo and Aaron. Heck worries, says, shit, we're going to have to break curfew. I'm going to have to shift us somewhere beneath them. All of a sudden, their ship gets fired on with something and gets rocked and takes some damage. Back to Mac, Tiffany, and KJ. They are deciding what to do next. They remember the capsule that they saw earlier in the basement of that house they were in. KJ thinks they should go back there. Mac wonders if KJ means for them to use it to chase after Heck and Naldo. KJ, though, is not saying that. She starts thinking through some of the time travel possibilities and argues, No, I'm thinking there never was another ship. What if that capsule thing we found this morning was the exact same capsule thing those guys just left in with the new kid? Before the girls can leave to go check on KJ's theory, Cardinal, the Restorer Officer in White, flies down on her pterodactyl thing 
and in her modified future version of English says, Come ashore, peacenik, now, eh? Cardinal starts walking towards the girls. Tiffany, she starts pointing the gun at Cardinal. Of course, there are no bullets in the gun, but Cardinal doesn't know that. Tiffany is going to bluff. Tiffany is threatening to shoot Cardinal, and she says her and her friends will not be going with her. Cardinal is skeptical if Tiffany would actually shoot her. But eventually, after Tiffany's insistence, Cardinal decides to lower her staff weapon. Mac, she eventually goes over to it and picks up Cardinal's weapon. But as she is inspecting it, she accidentally fires it. And it strikes the ground right below Cardinal. And Cardinal, she falls back and she hits her head on a tree. And it knocks her out temporarily. While Cardinal is knocked out, the girls run away. When Cardinal eventually wakes up, she reports into Grandfather and apologizes for her failure. In her modified English, she says, The young locals be harmed and dangerous. No choice but to try as adults. Permission de charge Ultimo? Grandfather replies, Denied. I'll punish them myself. We see Grandfather is walking in a room where there are various tubes, all filled with the many citizens of Stony Stream that they have collected. Back over to Aaron, Heck, and Naldo. Aaron is feeling better now. They are all in that capsule, but it looks damaged from their last interaction with the old timers. Heck and Naldo looks like they have phased incorrectly, and their bodies are not fully intact, and they will soon die. Naldo looks already dead. Heck tells Aaron, Ship kept us all in stasis long as it could, but I'm worried our storage cells could have cracked, so you need to vamoose. Aaron asks, why did they help her? Heck answers, you girls reminded us of us kids just trying to make a living are always the good guys. Go help your crew. Heck, he then passes out and dies. Aaron, she pounds on the door of the capsule and it opens and she walks out. And when the door opens, Aaron is in that basement of the house they were in earlier. And Tiffany, KJ, and Mac have all made their way there and are waiting for her. KJ's theory was accurate. Tiffany is wondering, hold up, does that mean that Aaron was in there the whole time, that she was also down here with us earlier? Mac replies, who cares? She then asks Aaron, those fruitcakes didn't hurt you, did they? Aaron says, no, they saved her, and now they're dead. Aaron tells the girls that the capsule thing has some sort of fuel leak, so they can't stay down here any longer. Outside of the house, Grandfather has personally came here to deal with this and Grandfather is standing with Cardinal. Grandfather calls out to the girls, Listen to your elders and come outside this instant. I'm sure you're confused, but whatever those juvenile delinquents in there told you is completely untrue. You have waded deep into a very old generational conflict. Those boys fancy themselves Robin Hoods stealing from the past to fund the future, but they're just a murderous gang of thugs. Get away from them before someone gets hurt. The paper girls inside the house are wondering what to do. They cannot stay in the house, but they don't want to surrender either. Luckily though, the time machine capsule activates and it transports the girls in time and all four of them get jumped through time. The girls then fall from the air and hit the ground. KJ seems to have been transported elsewhere but luckily, Aaron, Tiffany, and Mac are all together. And they are still in Stony Stream still. But they are no longer in 1988. They have been transported to the distant future of the year 2016. <laughs> Aaron, Tiffany, and Mac are in the middle of the road in Stony Stream. A car slams on its brakes as it almost hits them. The driver gets out of the car. Young Erin puts up her hands and yells, Excuse me, my name is Erin Tiang. I deliver newspapers and, and my friends and I need help, please. The woman who got out of the car replies, Is this a joke? My name is Erin Tiang. And we see a 40-year-old Erin standing before the girls. And with that cliffhanger, we end Volume 1.
All right, so that was volume one of Paper Girls, and I thought this was a fantastic debut volume. I thought the artwork was pretty nice. I had a lot of fun following our four lead characters in this book and seeing them play off one another and their various banter, some of the jokes they had. So I'm really liking these characters. I thought the concept of the book was pretty interesting, exploring some of this science fiction time travel stuff, the old timers and the teenagers. And I really want to know more about how that all works and their whole time travel war going on. And the cliffhanger we ended this volume on I thought was pretty compelling, with the girls being sent to the year 2016, their future, where they meet a future version of Eren. That is some great stuff. I'm going to give this opening volume an 8.5 out of 10. Thank you all for watching. Next week, I will be back with Paper Girls Volume 2. And you do not want to miss Volume 2, because Volume 2 is really fun, because we see some of the girls adjusting to the future. And there is lots of fun to be had there. So I will see you all for that next week. Thank you.